make sure I got everything. My disposal here. This is like a record for me. Two guests in a row on the Thursday podcast. All right. Are we ready? Yeah. Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr. It's time for the Thursday afternoon, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast. And I'm just checking in on you. What's going on? How are you? How's your week going? How's your week going? That's wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well, once again, two weeks in a row, we, uh, we have a special guest in studio. This is the one and only comic legend, Rich Scheidner, who has a new book he's here to plug. Um, that I actually got a couple months ago, but my wife is so goddamn pregnant, I've only been able to read bits and pieces of it. I read all of I Killed in 2006. He's got a book called uh, uh, Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Boom, which personally is my favorite, Eric, because I watched all of it. And that, was, yeah. and that made me want to be a comedian and all that. So, Rich, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bill. Um, I got to ask, so what year did you start officially as a comedian because everybody always has their yeah yeah well like, i did two open mics and i went to college for a semester people always try to they always try to delay when they stop so i really i really only been doing it six months yeah. they're like fucking 52 so when when is your official uh january 77 wow yeah you that's know, amazing washington dc there are no comedy clubs i was, was gonna say like yeah. where, where was there to gig yeah it was a a, a, a friend of mine you know, I was funny, and he said, you're funny. You've got to do this. I don't even know if we knew it would call it stand-up. He said, going to take you down and do, we can do this. You know, you can do it, the comedy at this place. And you were in law school? I was in law time? school. Okay. And uh, and uh, it was uh, Iguana Coffee House. It was just this basement in a church. You know, one of those all talent nights. Right. And I and I followed a uh, poet. I saw the tape. Cause my buddy you had the tape, tape like, of that? Yeah, I had the tape. I had the tape. The guy, audio, video? Audio, just audio. Just wow. a, you know, it was big black box cassette, like a shoebox size cassette player. Right. Recorder. And, uh, and, the, and the poet, his, his last line was, like the mango, we are ripe for the revolution. Oh, God. Right? He was, was like a like, decade too yeah, late, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> way ahead on mango. Nobody's talking mango in 77. Right. But you're right, way behind. Yeah. The Vietnam was over. War way was over. over and he was still trying to do yeah, that shit. Yeah, yeah. So when you guys went, that was what fascinated me back then. Because It's because of you guys that yeah. there was a comedy club. Your whole generation is the reason why there's a comedy club scene. And I've always like read stuff about Jay Leno, and it was just like... Yeah, you know, you'd be like, yeah, I'd go down to the combat zone, which is I, where like the red light district where Boston used to be, and you'd, you'd go on between like strippers and anywhere, anywhere, and, anywhere. This guy Howard Vine, who took me out the first time, he was like my unofficial. He says, "I found another place, like a talent night mm-hmm. called the Gay Cabaret," and we were so we had we just thought like Gay Cabaret, like the Flintstones. This was seventy seven, man. Yeah, the like closet happy. was packed. Yeah, yeah, it was packed. There was nobody <laughs> out of the closet except my overpopulation pushed out. You know, right? So we could end there, and it was you know it was a gay gay club. And the guy was like, really nice. hey, fellas, you know, it's a, normally great. It's open talent night, you know, but uh, this, is, this is ladies night. Well, once a month we have ladies night. And again, we're so clueless, we don't get it. We're like, ladies night, fantastic, man. I still don't get it. What does that mean? It was lesbians. Bottoms? It was lesbians. Oh. It was all lesbians. <laughs> I thought you meant bottoms. Yeah. <laughs> ladies night. So, yeah. Wow. And I go up in front of this lesbian crowd. I mean, they, you know, I'm the reason they're there to hi- get away from guys like me. How did it go? I'm just a swing. Oh, my God. I mean, you know what I mean. Chill. I mean, chill, freezing, cold. <laughs> I mean, a woman took me off stage, finally. Just, Dude. I mean, I got one line, I did, I was, I did like, a, my buddy told me, he said, you said like, I guess I'm your worst nightmare or something, and got a kind of a laugh. But you know, you know how stupid right. you are, I thought, oh, that's encouragement to do more instead of, take that as your exit. Yeah, as a cue that we, we, we didn't come here for this. Yeah, you're done. Wow. And, I, and the woman just walked up on stage, took me by the arm and led me off. Just oh. led me off. Just like a mercy I've had killer. that. I've had that. You right. know, when I started out, I, I had a gig and I, I didn't know it was a, I didn't know it was a gay club. I just got a gig. The, the fucking guy didn't tell me. The place was called Queen of Hearts. And what killed me was it was only a couple of towns over from, uh, from where I lived. And, uh, like, yeah, and that was, like, still, it was the 80s. It was oh, early 90s. That was still, like, totally, like, uh, um, you know, not accepted. There was no. no, I mean, I guess Billy Crystal played, was, like, the only guy who played a gay character. And that whole thing just, like, went away. So when I found out, I was all, like, paranoid. My truck's out there. I was all, like, homophobic. <laughs> <laughs> I just think I'm out here sucking dick, right? So I, um, I went there. And I was wearing my college, like, sweatshirt. Came walking in, like, a 23, 24-year-old. And I walked by this guy. And I forget what the hell he said. He just said, like, oh, my God, my fantasy or something like that. And I was just like, I was like, wow, that was really forward. So I went down to the end of the bar. And uh, one of the women I was working with, I was like, I, I walked in. She goes, hey, Bill, how you doing? I said, yeah. I said, good. I said, hey, that guy down the end of the bar, he's a little happy. 
She goes, what? I got a guy. I go down the other bar. He goes, I go, he's, he's a little happy. And she finally got it. She goes, Bill, everybody's a little happy here. Goes, this, is, <laughs> this is a gay bar. And then I looked around. I was like, oh, shit. I was totally freaked the yeah, fuck out. Yeah, yeah. But then, you know, by the time I got to New York, I was just like, yeah, I, you know, you start broadening your horizons. You don't give a shit. But uh, so you started out there. So what I what what made it blow up the way it did that all of a sudden there was just you could you know, in, instead of having to go on after a poet or a stripper or whatever you had to do. Like, I was always interested, like, what, what, like, what years did all of a sudden... All these scenes started. All these, like, independent, like, Boston had a comedy scene, right? The Ding Ho, you know, those guys, there's right. Lenny Clark and Barry Crimmins. And these. There was a scene up there. There was a scene in Washington, D.C. We found this bar. This guy started doing comedy at this bar. So Lewis Black, myself, Kevin Rooney... Ron wow. Zimmer, all these guys showed up to start doing stand up at this little bar in Southeast Anacostia. Like, and it was, and, and the fact that it was stand up exclusively must have it. been like, it was wow. A, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It became packed immediately. It became like wild immediately. And there was a scene in San Francisco with the Holy City Zoo and that comedy scene. There was one in Houston at a comedy workshop with Hicks and Kennison, and those guys were starting. Now, did LA, because I know Dangerfields was around since like the 60s. So, yeah. like, New York and LA actually had They had club. scenes. Look, I, I was doing it for like, a year or so, and a friend of mine said, she goes, you know, there are comics like you doing this up in New York City. I was like, what? She goes, yeah, there are comedy clubs. So she took me up there, and I, there were, you know, the improv, the comic strip, and Catch a Rising Star. But I didn't know about it until I went up there. That's so fascinating, because, like, there's no internet. There was no internet. No nobody way, knew, nobody like, knew anything. Like, this guy comes in, one night comes in to L. Brookman's, like, you know, around, and he walks up to me, he goes, hey, uh, I want to do uh, uh, some stand-up comedy. I said, yeah, we, we, at the end of the show, we, like, put guys on. The, no, I'm a comic out in San Francisco. We, we're doing, like, this out in San Francisco. I was like, what? See, yeah, I got a place, the Holy City Zoo. His name was Tony DePaul, and he was running the Holy City Zoo. So he told me, you got to come out here, man. We're doing this out there, too. And I was like, what? People are doing this? You didn't think, like, right. other people are doing it. We're just doing it. And you don't know. Nobody was talking. There was a scene in Philly. There were about six or seven cities that had scenes percolating, percolating. You know? So how did those guys back in the day, like if they had to do way back to like Ed Sullivan, like how did you put your set together? I know those guys did Vegas and they did casinos. I guess you just had to be based in New York or L.A. to it, get stage time to actually. But, yeah, but those guys, they, but they didn't. There, there were places all over. There were, you know, the, the, the nightclubs started happening right after World War One when. Like when supper the, clubs and right, stuff? Right, right. They started doing the speakeasy and all when, when Prohibition came in. So the comics mm. moved in out of vaudeville, started moving into these nightclubs to make real money. Right? right. So that's where it started. So there were always, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, they called them the toilets where these guys would train. You know, they go, right. oh, you go to work the toilets, a little little bar out in Jersey to do a little comedy, a little show. You'd be part of a show. You know, there's a singer yeah, and a dancer, comic. Yeah. Right, right. It wasn't exclusively comedy. The like Dangerfields wasn't exclusively stand-up. You know, Dangerfield yeah. had the singers and stand-ups and all. So they were Yeah, they, they were still mixes. got the piano. They haven't changed shit no. there. No, <laughs> hell no, man. <laughs> no, no. So what year did... So then I guess imagine as the supper club started to go away, then your guys' scene then that, created the, that, see, the comedy club. That's right. So my generation, they weren't going out to the dinner clubs, you know, going out and have a dinner and see a show. Nobody was doing it anymore. That was out. You know, was old dressed up stuff, as old yeah. people's stuff. So we were in rock concerts. So then that kind of like started fading, right? You know, you're going, you get a little older, you want to date, you just can't go date. Nobody. You know, so everybody's right. kind of looking for the next thing. And it happened. Like some guy opens up a comedy club. You know, there's the three paying comedy clubs out here in the late 70s in California. Mm -hmm. There was Mitzi opened a place down in, in Pacific Beach in 76 and moved over to, into La Jolla in 77. Then there was a, a guy, Mike Cali, opened a place, the Laugh Stop down in Newport Beach. And then Mike Lacey, which you've been down to Comedy Magic yeah. Club down in Hermosa Beach in 78. They were the first three paying, like paying, they'd bring comics in from LA and pay them a couple hundred bucks. Wow. And then Garvin's in Washington, D.C. opened in 79. January 79, started paying comics from New York to come down and do it. So at this point, you've been doing it like two years. I've been doing it two years, and I became an MC there. And that's where I met all those comics. I started working with Seinfeld and Bill Maher and Overton and all these at what time? At in. what point did you, did you start to sense, like, wow, man, like I sort of jumped into this thing that has just taken off. Like, what point did it really seem like... Like this, like the sky's the limit. It was almost like a real estate boom. Yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't, you know, it didn't, it took me a while. I mean, it, it you sucked in it. We weren't making money. Mm -hmm. You know, like the comic strip in Fort Lauderdale opened like January or so of 80. I yeah. remember going down there and I'm working with my first wife, Carol Liefer and Joe Bolster and Mark Schiff and Kelly Rogers and... And Kelly pulls me over in a comedy condo, right? Like the first comedy condo. So and it's got clean. A phone. It's clean. <laughs> and it's got a phone. It's got a phone inside. Wow. It's got a phone. And he goes, hey, he's got the phone. He goes, come here, come here. And he goes, whatever this guy says you can do, 
tell him you can do it. If he asks whatever he asks, tell him you can do it. So I got a phone guy who goes, hey, I just opened up this club in Ottawa, Canada. I need a guy who can go do two 45-minute sets. Can you do two separate 45-minute shows? I go, oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. I hang up the phone and go, Kelly, I got like a half hour if they buy everything. Yeah. If they take everything. <laughs> I'm killing. Right. I'm killing everything. He says, don't worry. You'll do it. Go do it. So I go up there. I do it a week, right? You know, my strategy was do all the material. Why did you need two? Because they had the same crowd. He didn't. Oh. It was a big bar. It was just a big bar. These comedy rooms at first, it wasn't like they set up, oh, we're going to be, you know, we're opening up a new club. We're going to build this club. They just, there was a rock bar. He wasn't getting a lot of business in the rock bar. I don't know where he got the idea. He said, I'm going to do comedy. Right, so once twice a month he was doing comedy, brought a comedian in. So I'm going to guess, guess what happened because they don't really pay attention to how long you're up there. It's just how well you're doing. Did you pull up short on your sets, or did you do? Do you think 40? I was counting back then, man? I know I'm drinking shots. I'm trying. I'm trying to come up with. I'm smoking weed between the sets, trying to come up with new. You know, I'm just up there doing whatever I can do to try to. You know, I mean, I did all the material I could do. That I had up front, and then just ran around the room like Jerry Lewis. You know, like I was out of my mind. Wow. You know, did just, you save a bit for the end to close oh, with? I didn't have any thoughts about yeah. saving bits. <laughs> I didn't have any thought about closer, opener. It's like just funny and hold them. Just hold the stage. And, and, and you pulled it off. I pulled it off. So at the end of the week, the guy goes, he's paying me. He goes, this was great, man. It was like a weekend, you know, like three days or something. He said, the guy's on the phone wants to talk to you. I pick up the phone. This guy goes, I got, I got a club in Montreal. I heard you're great. You want to come down here? Come, when? Now. Come on over. Just come over now. And I did the next week in Montreal. And then he puts me on the phone with, with um, uh, Mark um, uh, from Yuck Yucks, Breslin, from Mark Breslin from Yuck Yucks. Same right. thing, I went right to Breslin in Toronto. So I went out there and I did like, you know, three weeks in a row and I came back, I'm a headliner. I thought, I'm a headliner. Wow. I didn't even know what it was. But I, I'm like, I, I, was that two, three years in? I was, yeah, it was like in 1980, so I'm like three years in. Jeez. But I was open up for a lot of rock bands. I, I that, was, was it at that point you could quit your day job? I didn't have a day job. My, my last... Yeah, my last day job was, yeah, about then, because I, I was, my last day job was working in New York City. I was cleaning out apartments for the mob. I didn't know that's what I was doing, but that's what I was doing. Cleaning them out? What, you know, after, you know all after, down, down, downtown. Stacks down Stacks got shot for not returning <laughs> the fucking truck. <laughs> <laughs> what would you? Yeah, this, you don't remember this, but 77, around that era, my, my first apartment was in a base. It wasn't even a real apartment. It was just right. some walls thrown up. It was... Every other building was abandoned. Squatters everywhere. Oh, that's when it was down in, to East it Village. It was bankrupt. Right, it's bankrupt. De Niro and taxi era. Exactly. So they start selling buildings for a buck, but you had to promise to rehab the building within a year to turn it into a rental property. Oh my god! Right. So, dude, ten dollars. So you, I'm not. You'd, I'm, be, you'd I, be set for. Well, I, you had to fix them up. Right, right. Right. You had to fix them up. So I'm having a hard time paying the rent. So the landlord goes, "Hey, man, can you do carpentry work?" And I lie. I go, "Yeah, yeah, I can do carpentry work." He says, go over there and help these guys. <laughs> How much of your life has been like, yeah, I can do that. And just fucking showing up and running around like Jerry Lewis. <laughs> so That's I, amazing. So you say, yeah. And yeah. Then, then so what I do show you up, do? I go over there. These guys are New York guys. They figure out in three seconds I can't really do carpentry. But they, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an okay guy. You know, get some cigarettes and beer. Go get some cigarettes and beer for us. You know, go, right. go do this. Go do that. You know, I'm go for and for them. Right. So at the end of the day, the guy goes, yeah, you can't do carpentry, but can you clean out an apartment? I go, well, yeah, I can. You know, my family's yeah, I can tidy built up. on manual labor, man. That's, that's how we stayed on the planet, manual labor. Right. So I show up the next morning. There's three young Italian guys. I even, they're standing outside the building. They're passing around a half point. They go, hey, you ready? Go, yeah, I'm the new guy. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's go. We went, we're throwing squatters out. We're cleaning out apartments. Oh, God. We're throwing people out of apartments. You know, we're going in, we're throwing, we're going in the, the shooting galleries, man. People are shooting up. We're throwing stuff out the windows. We're th or hustling people out. So what, uh, well, shit. Five bucks break, an hour. Break. Five bucks an hour. Under the table. Five bucks to an hour. To throw people out on the street. Now, break down the whole emotion of that. You walk up to the door. Is it unlocked? Is it locked? Yeah, you walk up the door. And, and I'd been in a squatter place when I first moved up there, so I kind of understood it, you know. But you see it, like extension cables running them from building to building. They were, you know, just stealing electricity from everywhere. I don't know how to to back up with your life. So how the fuck did you... So you go up there, you live you, in you a go, squatter building? I, when I first... How does that go down? No, that was, that was 74. When I, first, I went to New York in 74, but I had no plan. And you had no money, and then you no just money. see an abandoned building. You walk no, in guy, there, I, there's I, other people in there? Yeah, guy, a guy was... like Escape from New York. <laughs> <laughs> people crawling up out of manholes? Yeah, people are... People are they'd get a building, they'd own it. They'd put, you see locks on the outside of the door. There were no locks like a key lock. The right. guy would have a padlock, you know, a padlock, right. right? That's how he got in and get out. And then he'd lock the inside. He'd have bolts and lock the inside. And mm -hmm. they'd have electricity stealing from one building or another building, whatever. They were running cables. And some places had no electricity. 
That we just I'm sure that was. wasn't a fire hazard. I love no. that there's some guy that actually could be working as an electrician, but is deciding to live for free in this fucking building. It, it People was, are fascinated. Yeah, yeah. All right. So now, now, you, now you're on the other side. Okay. <laughs> the fucking student has become the master. Now you're going to throw someone out like yourself because you went on drugs. But so what was, what was that? People was, crying, was, screaming, fighting. They yeah, must so, no, people were like, okay, cool. Cause they'd gotten notice. It wasn't like surprised. They, oh. they did ignore the notice. They put notice. This building has been bought and you got to leave, evacuate, you know, or, uh, get out, whatever it is. And they were ignoring it or they, and so some people were cool. Okay. We're going. Some people, they kicked in doors. We go running in, we throwing their stuff out the windows. Right. It was wild. But where there's so many abandoned buildings, and they'd be like, all right, fuck it, I'll just grab my shit and just go down the street and around the corner, I'll have another I, one? Yeah, I don't know what their attitude was. I mean, I didn't really care. I mean, it was pretty hectic. It was pretty... Did you, you have know, to physically... There end- were a couple times we had to, like, you know, fight off people or push them around. But you had These the guys were rough. Guys These there, guys yeah. were rough. They were young and rough, man. Oh, okay. Did they, they have rough. the Joe Pesci shiny suits and shit? <laughs> no, like, no. I watched they, too many they mob were, movies. They were, they were, suits. They were dre- you know, they were dressed and ready for business. Oh, the, you know le- I mean? the three-quarter leather, the classic <laughs> three-quarter leather that every jerk-off like me <laughs> wore, and I was not that guy, man. Wow. <laughs> That's fucking amazing. So um, I don't want to spend too much on your past because we're here to, 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 to uh, I mean, we're definitely going to go back because I'm a geek for all of this shit, but... Um, Let's talk about the presence here. You're uh, kicking through the ashes. The parts that I read, what I loved about it is you, you do not sugarcoat any, like the, what happened, the odds of you making it, anything. It was really kind of like, like you just kind of laid it out there. Yeah. Like how do, um, I know you've done books in the past and, and stuff. And how did this whole thing, like, I mean, it had to be through just telling stories to guys like me, knowing how interested I am in this shit. You know, you tell these stories for years. You tell these stories. And sometimes I hear stories come back and go, well, that's, a, that's my story. That's not how it went. You know, you tell right. a story or whatever, like the Ollie Joe Prater story. I'd hear stories like a, the come Let me hear that one because I've always seen his. Now, he, now, for you guys listening, he's a legendary comic from the comedy store, I believe. Yeah. Had a cowboy hat and a beard. He was you're right. He and, was doing the Larry Cable guy sort of country western comic before... You know, and I always any- read his first name is Oily because I'm I have like a learning disability <laughs> or I'm just a moron. And then someone finally said the name. I'm like, oh shit, that's how you say his name. So that guy, Gilbert Herzog, was his real name. Gilbert Herzog. 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 And he went by Ollie Joe Prater. Ollie Joe Prater. And he looked right. like Yosemite Sam. He's a short guy. He was heavy. He had cowboy boots, a cowboy hat. You know, he looked like a cartoon character. Right. And he was a classic. I mean, see, back when these clubs started popping, the places were packed. They didn't need guys to draw. They mm-hmm. had packed. They wanted guys to sell alcohol. We were liquor right. pimps, you know. Who sold the most? And Ollie Joe would drink on stage. And so what, the crowd would drink with him. What would they pay you guys back then? To well, it started escalating fast. I mean, you first go out, they go, you know, it's 800 bucks a, a week. And then the, the, they go, we want you back. We want you back. What these other clubs want you. So they just like, we'll pay you well, twice. twice. That went times. up by about 400 bucks 20 years later when I started. <laughs> That's what I loved in New York when we, we almost had that strike. It was like, it was 50 bucks for a weekend spot for like 20, 30 years. 50 bucks, 50 bucks, and everything else up. All the club yeah, owners were yeah. multi-millionaires, and finally we were like, what the fuck? And we asked for 100, just knowing that we get like 75, and they completely freaked out. But uh, um, anyways, getting back no, to that. No, it started escalating fast. But, but, but guys like Ali Joe were, you know, he was a real, he sold. You'd come in, they go, Ali Joe just sold like $13,000 worth of liquor last week. And what was his style? Was it sort of uh, Larry? He was, he, he was like, you know, oh, I'm a hair boy, I'll tell you what. And he, Larry he, the Cable Guy, Foxworthy? No, he was Which, blue. He was blue, blue and, okay. he was, and he was, you know, he would chug a beer. He'd start his act by just like chugging a beer and going, and then he'd belch. And he'd go, that's everything I learned in college. Oh, Jesus. So he set the tone early. He set I, the tone. I would not want to follow that guy today. No, he, he was, and he, and he literally took anybody's act. I mean, there was an old line, and I don't know whose line this was, but... Somebody once says, if Ollie Joe came up and bought you a beer, that means he just did one of your jokes. Wow. If Ollie Joe shared a joint with you, he did a couple of your jokes. If Ollie Joe laid out a line of Coke for you, you just played Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't care. And, and I, it seemed like back then, like certainly through like vaudeville, like people just taking other people's shit, it was, always seemed annoying. But like it, it wasn't like the way it is now, where it's just like it's it's like that, you know post nine eleven. Like uh, why are you being hostile? Like I, I remember seeing George Burns one time on sixty minutes or something, and he said, you know, yeah, I used to do this bit, blah 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 blah. You know, he tells the joke. He goes, you know, you know, it's, he goes, yeah, I mean, it's not a great joke. I don't think Milty would steal it. 
And like he threw that out there on TV and years and I was just thinking like, oh, he's just ribbing him. And then years later when I became a comedian, I was just like, wow, like he, he really meant something by that. And that guy must have been, you know, at least fucked with his act on some level that if he's that George Burns is on 60 minutes <laughs> and fucking calls somebody out for, for taking his shit. So, yeah, but you, it didn't matter to him like it does now. See, it did not see the, uh, Milton owned that. He, he, they used to call him the thief of bad gags. He owned it. He he like he was like I I didn't steal this one. Or I stole that one. Or they didn't care like we did. Right. You know it, they did worry about stealing their acts back in Vaudeville. They used to the only way to like prevent it was they would pay stagehands to protect their acts. So if you came in and I just played there, and then you came in, you start doing my bits. Sandbag drops near you. Oh you know, they, shit! They would like give you a warning. You know they get like a heavy warning. <laughs> But then, see, that era... The shit you could get away with before cell phone cameras and stuff. You could literally <laughs> deliberately drop it on the guy's head. He dies. Oh, we know what happened to him. He never showed up. He's fucking underneath the stage. Wow. It changed in Lenny Bruce's time. See, before that, the comics were just kind of shtick, you know? And so you do some shtick, and then people were buying jokes and selling yeah. jokes, and they were pretty interchangeable. I just flew in from California. Boy, am I arms tired. It was just all shit like that. Yeah, it didn't matter. So when... Lenny and, and those guys started making what the comic said was important. It became artful and it mattered and you became tied to material. Mm -hmm. So like what you said mattered and people wanted to believe that that was really you. Right. That was really your opinion. That was really your life. Then it mattered. Then you started taking things and it mattered. Okay. So when you come along, I mean, that's, that's 25 years after Lenny Bruce. What, the thing that it didn't matter with you guys was because there's no YouTube, there's none of that shit, and you guys are just going up after poets and strippers and stuff. Well, so yeah, once I got into just go up and survive, or yeah, but once I fucking got into business, it mattered. It started to matter, but you right. know, there were so few comics, we could police the community ourselves. Right, that's the difference. You know, like a guy became a thief, he doesn't get to work the clubs, he doesn't get to work the, the A rooms. It was like when I, start, when I started in Boston, dude. If you, if you if you went over your time, if you went over your time. <laughs> And by over your time, like, you know, we told you to do 25 minutes. You did 28, 28. Like you were in the fucking doghouse. Like, dude, what the, f you did three extra minutes. Like, like it was such a huge thing. And, and forget about stealing jokes. It, it, like, like I'm so fortunate that I started in Boston and all those ding ho guys, like, so set the bar so high that, um, if you were any hack, if you were any like derivative, they'd let you go for like two, three years. You're okay. You're influenced by Gav or Sweeney or, or <laughs> Noxy or something. But then after that, it was just like, dude, you need to come up with your own shit. And, but, and it was one of those things like Boston's an unforgiving place. So it's just like, yeah. once you were labeled, you were, you, you had to leave. So, um, <laughs> see, that's it. That's, that's it. You got trained. You got trained. There's nobody doing the training anymore, but you got trained. And that's how they did it in Vaudeville, too. The same sort of things, man. They right. trained you. They trained. The guys would be coming up. They'd have to learn to do it the right way, or you wouldn't get any time. What was the first, like, real comedy club, like, uh, not, like, you know, going up to Ottawa, but, like, you, you, were, you felt like, like, when did all, like, those A rooms start coming up? Like, the punchlines, the... Uh, punchlines started around 82. They all started, yeah. you know, there's some great rooms that started. But mm -hmm. A lot of these rooms, they started... Uh, I mean, I wrote it in a book. There was one, one like, you go, you go up to Minneapolis to play a room. I'm going to play a place called Mickey Finn's. Now, a lot of these rooms were like, they just threw them together. Right. So I get out there, and, you know, I, I felt like the gunslinger. I come into town. I'm like one of the first acts they bring in. I'm from New York. I see all those guys, Jeff Cesario, Louis Anderson, they're all standing in the back. Wow, Bill Bauer, they're all standing in the back. I said, I knew those are local comics. They're, they're, they're those guys were all from, from Minneapolis, yeah, uh, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so they're all wow. in the back of the room. They're all standing. I, see, I could see them. You, you pin them. You go, there they are. There they are. They're here to check me out. Right. I said, I'm going to hit that stage, man. I'm going to let them know I'm here, man. I'm going to rub there, man. I'm going to rock star, you know? Right. So I hadn't checked anything out. So I go running up and jump on the stage. The stage was just a bunch of milk cartons, right? Milk crates with a sheet of plywood on top. Oh, God. So I go fly. I just surf the whole thing. The whole thing just takes off. I just go flying it, <laughs> go to a couple tables, hit the wall, partially separate my shoulder, jump up. Like and Probably the biggest laugh you got that yeah, night, right? Yeah, huge. They're like, hey, everybody's laughing. I hey, put the stage back in place, and I did my set. Oh, my God. So yeah. who, else, now, who else was uh, part of that Minneapolis scene? That was a big name, Cesario yeah, and yeah. Louis Anderson. Yeah, yeah. Have you been watching Louis on uh, Zach? Oh, show? yeah, he's great. That's what I love about comedy is, is, is sometimes is like, dude, you should do something with this person. But who would ever would have thought That's... Louis should play Zach's dad and, and Zach was a, went to clown college in France <laughs> and ends up in Bakersfield, California. I was talking to my wife about that last night. We were uh, laying in bed and the, and the commercial came on for it. 
And they're just like this fucking like perfect casting together going like, who the have like, no, that's it. That yeah, is. in the way that they, they go back and forth, it's like they've been working together for like 50 years. They're like an old comedy team. And uh, <laughs> that's one of the things, one of my favorite things as like, because despite how long I've been in this business, I've always just, I've maintained that whole nerd sort of huge fan of um, of stuff like that. So um, who is a guy that when you were in the early 80s, like, you know, there's always those guys that, you know, when you start out. You just like there's no fucking way this person. If this person doesn't make it, nobody's gonna make it. Like those guys, you could be the worst manager in the world, and you knew that someone was gonna make it. Do you remember seeing anybody like that? Well, you knew, and this is you know a lot of guys don't realize it, but you knew. Looking back, you go like Leno. You go Jay Leno. The first time I saw him, I go, this guy's a killer. I've always heard that. I heard he's, he's like. I a, mean, just destroyed rooms. He had the belt for like what? Yeah, fifteen years before yeah, he yeah. basically before he had to do the Tonight Show every night. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd go into clubs and I'd be like, I'd go in. First thing I'd say is. Who's got the record? Who's got the time? You know, who's done the longest here? Ah, this guy, Glenn Hurst, did an hour and 45. It's done tonight. It's over tonight. <laughs> you know, I'm doing two. Easy. You know, and I'd go gunning for everybody. And then I'd go into town, and after Leno started working at clubs, right, when he started doing Letterman, start popping big, you'd go in and go, who's got the other? Jay Leno just did three hours. Oh, three hours. What did he do? Lock the doors like Wagnerian opera? What did he do? Hold the audience here? No, he had four ovations. They brought him back four times. That's, um, and he still had the materials. That's what's always blowing my mind about those people. Like, man, there was a period where people were trying to like set the record, and they were going on stage for like seven, eight, nine yeah. hours. I was just always picturing like eight hours in, you just like, hey, what's up with chairs? You know, and just like, like, how do you still have? Yeah, yeah. yeah. At that point, it's yeah. it's just like you're just not getting nah, off stage. Nah, nah, that that's you know, it, that's like world. Right? You might as well be sitting on a fucking yeah, flagpole at that. No, point. Exactly, exactly. What kills me is somebody actually sat there and watched all of that. And there's a fucking you know two people left from the wait staff nah, that have to stay there. Nah, nah. This was but this was a legit show. Right. This was a legit show because people were drinking and doing coke and they had they the crowd could hang. Right. This was legit. This before the drunk driving laws change. This was all different. What class were you from as far as like, so you, I know you were in New York. How long were you in well, New Richard York Richard Belzer was the king in New York stand-up comedy wow, back then. I love Belzer. Yeah, he was, I mean, you see him work that room catch. He just owned it. You know, he, he just set the record for playing like a, a TV character for the longest time on a show or something like that. Really? He set something. I remember being at Nick's Comedy Stop in the early 90s and he was headlining and he was going, yeah, you know, they want me to do this uh, this procedural show or something like that. You know, what do you think? You think I should, should I do it? Should I do it? I remember sitting there in the back of the club going, what the fuck is this guy asking us? Of course you're going to do it. Should I be on TV? Absolutely. <laughs> I didn't realize how much money he was making as a comedian. But, like, uh, it's kind of cool that I, I remember reading that, like, within, like, the last, like, few weeks that he just set some fucking record for playing the same guy yeah. on the same show since basically my entire stand-up career, like, almost wow. like 25 Wow, twenty five. I, I didn't years. realize it's been that long. Yeah. So you were. Uh, he sorry, was the so guy. Yeah, no, he was the guy. Gilbert Gottfried. I saw when he. You saw him. We were like that. that he's the guy. I mean, right. he, I went. I I once watched him too many nights in a row and went down to the East River and burned all my material, burned all my notebooks. Oh jeez. Burned them all. I said, I'm just hack. I've always told this story. One of my favorite ones I ever saw him. He went up at Nick's Comedy Stop one time in front of a bunch of fucking drunk. Boston morons and they were not getting him and he didn't waver at all he did his shit he had this little old man yellow sweater on and I remember one of his jokes because all the comics were dying laughing he was just bombing in front of this crowd I remember he goes you know I went to a party the other night and I ran into Jackie Onassis and I said Jackie do you remember where you were (laughs) and we're all dying laughing and nobody got it Nobody got the joke, and then he would just go on to the next one and do fucking dead like silence, and he he toughed his way through that. But uh, first time I saw him, I wasn't in the business. Was I saw him in one of the uh, Beverly Hills Cops movies? You were in Beverly Hills Cop Two, two. yeah. What was that like? Uh, You know, it's funny. I mean, I I think I filmed for like four days for five seconds of screen time. A couple of that's how it usually works, and it was fun. It was hanging out. You know, it was that time when I saw, wow, this is a star, Eddie Eddie Murphy. There was a scene where they're going. All right, Eddie, uh, we got to hold on a minute. We got to change some lighting. And he goes, I'm ready. He goes, yeah, but the, the director said, hold on a minute, Eddie. We'll, we'll get you a minute. So Eddie goes to me. He goes, come on, let's go. So he goes, grabs like a bag of bread off the craft table. And, and we go down to the, this is the Playboy Mansion. So we just go down. He starts feeding the geese or whatever, just throwing bread to him. So about five, ten minutes later, mm-hmm. one of the ADs comes and goes, Eddie, they're ready for you now. Eddie just doesn't even turn around. Just keeps feeding the, feeding the, the geese. Right? Eddie, wow. we're ready. We're ready. He does, ignores them. They leave. They come back five minutes later. Eddie, are you ready now? And he just he made him wait. They made him wait. He made him wait. Well, I, I said, "That's." I go, "That's power." That's you know. He's like, 
The fucking balls. That, that, yeah, I, I would never. I, I would can, never. Exactly. I'd be like, they go, ready now, go, you got it. Absolutely. How Thank high? You. How high jump? Yeah, yeah, hat in hand. Yeah. yeah. I, I'll never get. Uh, no. I've never understood like people that, uh, what's, what's funny and tragic is watching people pulling those moves when they don't have the power. <laughs> Which, which I, I've seen a lot, seen especially that. now where so many aspects of the entertainment build business because of the internet have just gone down the shit, like the entire music business. You know, anybody nowadays who complains, where's all the good music? It all sucks. I always go, well, you get what you pay for. <laughs> and I'm guilty of it, too. I, I stole, I lime-wired a lot of shit. I lime-wired. Yeah, that. a couple of fucking laptops that just got <laughs> virused out. Before I, somebody finally went like, dude, you're in this business. You should pay for it. Like, uh, I think it might have been Russ Maneev in New York said that to me. And I haven't, I haven't illegally downloaded a song or anything in like a dozen years. Way back to like uh, Napster. LimeWire was the last one that I used. So, Napster. Um, oh but anyways, yeah, I've, I've seen people like um, try to pull that. Do you know who I am? And all of that. And, it's, and the people who do that now, it's just like, dude, you are not paying attention to this business where like remember like back in the day to try to get if they got like two major stars in a movie it was just like holy yeah. fuck this is gonna be like a blockbuster forget about now where like every movie is like oceans 11 now like you got like <laughs> like everybody got just bumped down like tw like like the shit that i would go in and audition for in like the 90s you'll have now a guy who like used to star in fucking movies, like B level movies yeah. is going and taking that spot. All these stars are on TV and you just see these people pulling their moves. But, um, that <laughs> I, I can't, I mean, that happens on a movie set. Like it, like yeah. the lighting isn't right. It's yeah. a lot of waiting around. Yeah. I mean, there, there's an entire crew, film crew there, people all over. They had, you know, the scene was they were going to shoot Eddie just walking past right. a bunch of women playing volleyball in bikinis. Right. right. So we get up to the scene and they start doing it. And the, and the director's yelling. He goes, jump higher, girls, jump higher, you know, jump higher. He's trying to get jiggle going. Oh, and I God. see, I go to Eddie, go, there's too much DuPont out there, man, to jiggle. Yeah. Right? And Eddie <laughs> does that laugh, you know, oh, oh, he does yeah, that yeah. laugh. The director goes, what? And he goes, he tells him what I said. The director he goes, yeah, you're right. All right, let's shoot the scene. Forget it. Oh, it's yeah. all silicon, man. There ain't no jiggling happen. Now, how is Eddie handling, uh, I mean, did you know Eddie before? You, yeah, I knew him from back in New York in the day. I mean, the first time he came in the improv, I was I was the MC on Sunday night. I was like the regular. When I was in town, I was. And that was when it was down on like Forty Sixth or Forty Fifth Street on the West Side. It was on Forty Fourth, Forty Fourth and Ninth, right, right there. Yeah, because okay. I used to live in that neighborhood, oh, and, right. I, and we used to go down and. Uh, I read this whole thing. It might have been you know something I heard from you or something, and, and it's now it's like it's a, a pizza place mm -hmm. or something, and that's where Richard Pryor that really raw video of him just standing. Oh. When he was stopped being the Bill Cosby clone, he, right. and he was turning into Richard, like he literally was turning into Richard Pryor, the greatest of all time, and like that always blew my mind that that was within like fifteen blocks of where I lived, and I would go in there and get the pizza. The pizza was only okay, <laughs> but I just wanted to be like, so, like see I, that wall. Like, well, just wondering where the fucking stage was. Yeah, can I ask a total geek question? When yeah. you walked into that. Because it's basically the same space. Right. Where was the stage? You walk in. The stage is all in the back of the room. There was, a, there was an emergency door exit right by the stage. And the stage is a little, you know. Was it all one room? There was no walls? You didn't one, walk there was, a, there was one room. There was a bar. There was a, there was a bar out there. Everybody hung out in a the bar. There was a good bar. It was uh -huh. a cool bar. Everybody hung out there. And then you'd walk through this little narrow, little narrow hallway, but short. You know, and the men's bathroom was on the right hand side of literally like a toilet and a and a sink in a in like a, one of those little closets. Right. And then you'd walk in this little hall and the light was right there, like by the service bar. So if you're on stage and you see Rodney come under that light, you know, mm -hmm. you go, Dangerfield's here, gotta get off, gotta get Rodney on quick. He's making the rounds, getting ready to do a tonight show or something. So wow. you see people pop up into that light area. Probably see his fucking silhouette too, and you know who he was. <laughs> oh yeah, you just see him. You just see him. He just he'd pop in, he as soon as you saw him, he'd pop out and you know, get up. And I, Rodney was like, because I saw Rodney when I was on stage, I'd cut mid joke. You know. And then the, hey, we got a special guest here. <laughs> <laughs> and right away, I remember going. On, I remember going off, and Rodney coming on goes, "Hey, you know how to fucking move? The kid knows how to move, man. He moves. He that's, knows how to move. That's man. awesome, man. You know, I like that. that. It just reminded me one time. I, I did a, uh, I did a benefit at this um, theater in, in Beacon Beacon Theater. I forget what the hell the goddamn benefit was. But it was the sickest lineup I was ever on. It was uh, John Stewart was hosting. Max Weinberg brought his band. Tony Bennett goes on first. Then Bruce <laughs> Springsteen. Then they auctioned off one of his guitars, 
uh, to this rich crowd that goes for like a hundred grand. Then fucking Joe McHale had to follow that. <laughs> like I, I, Joe McHale's got, he has to have the, I followed fucking story. Right. <laughs> um, and then I went up after him, which, you know, he was the total buffer to get it back to. All right. Settle down, settle your, down. your expectations. <laughs> this, this is what you paid for here. Right. And Seinfeld was closing. That was the lineup. And um, I remember when I was doing my set, I was conscious about not being too dirty because, I mean, Seinfeld's like the king. And I remember looking over. I was getting close to the end of my set. And he was standing on the side of the the, uh, the stage. And, you know, the light was behind him. So he was, like, backlit. And I, I knew who he was with his silhouette. Like, that's how famous this guy is and to me. And it wasn't just Jerry hanging out. He had the suit on. It was Jerry ready to go to work. And I was immediately thinking, like, oh, my God, am I being too blue? Is he going to hate me? Am I pissing him off? Am I going over? <clears throat> and I remember when I got off stage, he went, like, uh, I walked by him, and I was just, and I was just, I was almost afraid to say hello. I just, like, walked by, and he just went, very funny, very funny. And then I apologized for working, you know, the way I do. I said, oh, sorry, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I, I don't care. He, he almost, like, laughed, like, dude, I don't give a shit. And I'm thinking, like, that's right. This guy always worked clean, and he worked clean before there was even comedy clubs. So I can't imagine him going on after these guys who would chug a beer and then burp and be like, that's what I learned in college. And, like, that sort of energy is fun, but it whips him into, like, this frat, that, frat boy yeah, frenzy. Yeah. And then you got to go up there, and if you have, like, a, a more of a, you know, just straight lace kind of like, yeah, I mean, I have a beer every once in a while, but, guys, like, I'm not letting this totally affect my life, you know? Wait, First of all, I love the fact that you did that. That's the training you got in Boston to go, I'm part of the show. I know I'm not closing, so I'm going to respect the headliner. You oh, yeah. know how he works. A lot of guys oh, that was another. That. that was another way that you would get, you would get blackballed. I remember uh, there was a comedian up there, uh, Mike Donovan. You ever work with him? I know who he is. Fucking hilarious guy. And he used to always say this thing was hilarious. And he'd be like, he'd be like yeah, just go up there, uh, you know, do like 20 minutes. You know, give you like, you know, th three to five fucks is what he would say. <laughs> It is the thing. He wasn't bullshitting. He was like, people in Boston counted, you fucks. So I remember, uh, you know, sometimes going over it and being in a panic, like, oh my God, that was my sixth fuck. Donovan's going to call Mike Clark and I'm going to be, I'm going to be ruined in this town. I said fuck six times. So, um, I mean, I don't want to sit there and be like the old guys and just, cause I don't know what it is like for kids coming up now. And when I say yeah, yeah. kids, kids to me now are anyone up to like 32, 33. Um, coming up now, but I'm, I'm sure that they uh, have their uh, their whole way that that, that it, they it, all, it always changes. But I like that. But you know, Seinfeld always had that discipline. I remember working with him in these Jersey gigs. So these Jersey gigs were like fifty five dollar Jersey gigs that started. They were like the first paying gigs we could get. Go out to Jersey in some bar, right? And so you know, it's survival time in a bar. So a lot of guys would be like, "What do I got to do to get by?" You know, yeah, fuck dick with the shit, crowd, dick, dick shit, shit, dick shit, jokes, shit, whatever yeah. I got to do to get Good by. Night. Right? And I remember working with Jerry one time. And he goes on, and he'd follow all that, and he stays right to what he's doing, man. Works clean. Brings him to him. Right. No, but he wasn't killing. It's not like all oh, they all came to him. They were like, oh, wait a minute, the party's over. It wasn't great. But right. he never broke. He never wavered. And I was, afterwards, I go, wow, man. He goes, he goes, I'm getting ready to do tonight's shows. That's what I'm preparing to do. He had the focus. He had the long-range focus. He was like, I'm practicing this material here now because I'm going to do this on the tonight show. Right. I'm working this out now. I'm not worried about my $55 jersey gig. He's, he's one of those guys. Long range view. Yeah. He's one of those guys that he just fucking knew where he I feel. Yes. He, that's he exactly. just knew where he was going. And he just like, uh, you'll never meet a guy that doesn't suffer fools the way he does. <laughs> I still, when I get around him, I get nervous. I'm, like, I'm going to say one stupid thing. And this guy's going to, I'm going to get that look. And that's just going to be it. <laughs> He'll turn like, and walk he, away. The same way, like his act is yeah. the way he lives his life. There's yeah. no fat. Yeah. There's no extra words yeah. or any of that type of shit. And then the yeah. guy just fucking just like, he just walks towards what he wants, walks right through it. I mean, not, not like in a malicious no. way. Just like he just eye on the fucking prize, that guy. You know, back in the day, guys would go like, you know, I don't like his act because you don't really know who he is up there. I go, are you fucking paying attention? Yeah. You know exactly. You know what pisses this guy off? The missing sock in a fucking dryer. Yeah. <laughs> That's who he is, man. I He's it. paying attention. He's fucking paying attention to the details. That's what's irritating this guy. I did his web series one time, and I told him that. I told him how I hated that they said his show is a show about nothing. It's like, no, it isn't. This guy has contempt for 90% of people and activities. I was actually nervous saying it to him, and he laughed, and he goes, I think you're being generous by saying it, you know, that it's only, only 90%. 90%. Only 90%. Yeah, yeah, but he's... Uh, um, 
That's so fucking cool. So when did like, uh, oh God, there's so many things I want to ask you. This is far. So the improvs, the improv started in New York City and then they opened the LA one, right? And they opened the LA one because he realized everything was moving out to LA when Johnny moved, when Carson moved. That was a t- When he moved in 72, the whole thing shifted. The axis shifted, right? Everybody That's had to go out to like- L.A. And the comedy store just opened then. So the comedy store became people going on, on the Tonight Show going, yeah, I work out at the comedy store in L.A. That became the place. Wow. Right? So I Bud's like, I got to get out there. Yeah. And then the- Oh, because he wasn't getting the brand recognition anymore. No, he was getting it when he was in New York, and the comics would go on the Tonight Show in New York and go, I work out the improv here in New York, like Klein or those comics. Wow. But then it shifted, immediately shifted. That's why Leno went right out to L.A. Leno saw Freddie Prinze go on the Tonight Show and say, I'm working at the comedy store. And Leno goes, I got to get out to the comedy store. Yeah. Right. And so- the franchise didn't start opening until the 80s, like 84, when Mark Anderson opened one in San Diego. Then that started, he started opening up this improv and did, franchise. Did, did Bud, like, Bud franchised it out? Franchised when, when, it out. When he saw the whole that, boom happening. That's when, that's when he made money. That's when he really made money. Mark Anderson opened these clubs, and Bud was making huge So it's bank. like the Trump thing. Well, I've heard a lot of that stuff that says Trump on it. They're, they're paying for the they're name. They're paying for the name. Yeah, that's so yeah, smart. So, so Bud was getting, like, a gross of every club, I think. All right, I got to ask you, because, like, I... You know, you're doing the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, which mm. has to be the most nerve wracking, huge possible thing. Like huge. sleepless nights, and like, yeah. What, what what year did you did you first do it? Eighty four. You did it in eighty four. Oh my god. Yeah. So you're gonna go on there. I mean, it's just yeah. at that point, it's 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 that that show. Like, I, I feel bad for young people. They don't understand how huge that yeah. fucking show yeah. was. It was just like it was, it was everything. everything. It was the Beatles on on the Ed Sullivan. It was. Elvis, For stand-up it was, comic, it was, it was everything. It was everything. So you, they tell you you're getting the show, so you must be like over the moon excited. And then for me, what would immediately hit would be the dread of like, oh, fuck, now I have to do this. And I have to somehow compartmentalize the fucking terror of yeah. this guy who can either invite me over, give me the okay, or my, all of my peers are going to see that That's he right. didn't like me because I, I and everybody watched this it. Shit, so everybody I, watched it. Yeah. So here's the deal: how it worked. And, and correct me if I'm wrong here. He he would give you what would he? He would give you the okay. He would call you. He'd either call you over. That was the highest. That's it. Or you got the okay. So right. you're still coming back. That's right. Which is acceptable for the first time. You're a yeah, nervous. yeah, yeah. But then there was the one where he would just be like, no, they would be drumming his pencil on the table. Oh. You take his pencil and just drumming it and not looking at you. And that was like it, man. That was the worst. Oh, and he knew he was. He knew what he was doing to the comic out that day. Yeah, yeah. I read. It, I read that book that his lawyer read. I mean, just Bushkin. How, yeah, it was a yeah, great book. How ice cold his mother was. Like oh. the ability to do that. It's like that's the trickle down. Yeah. Effect. Yeah. Um, I'll tell yeah. you how I I dealt with doing Letterman because Letterman was my Carson. Like I literally had to. I was so fucking like thinking what am i gonna do i had to like work up like a healthy level of hatred because that's just how i'm wired i'd be like you know fuck this guy for making me so fucking and then he was a great guy came over shook my hand and everything but like i had to literally be thinking fuck this guy and then to go out there so i went out there and i had thank god i had a great set and i remember like you you see it on tv and you think he's fucking 80 yards this way and the band's 100 yards this. they're all right there like you, you could take two steps over and shake paul's hand another three you could shake dave's and i remember doing my set hearing dave laugh and it was such a fucking it was more relief yeah. it was like oh my god he's laughing yeah. he's laughing i was you know yeah. trashing getting married so it was like in the wheelhouse because he wasn't married or anything like that it was, it was just I don't. I just remember thinking, like, I was so fucking relieved when it was over, man. Yeah. I was just so relieved. So yeah. tell me what, that, what that was. It, but sort of on Letterman show. Letterman was almost behind you on camera, so the audience could. See, you were. They were. Letterman was in the sight line, so they're looking at you and seeing Letterman over your shoulder. So if you didn't oh. have Letterman laughing, you could die. Oh wow! You know, so well, you by the time the, I did, they didn't have like they he was, moved it. They he moved was it. already over at CBS. Oh, so I, I'm talking about the NBC show. Okay, so anyway, '84, I was in New York uh, because. Uh, I left the, the Summer Olympics were out here and I said I'm going to get out of LA this is going to be a mess and so Kennison and I booked over to New York for the summer mm-hmm. and I was there and I was working out and Jim McCauley the Tonight Show booker saw me in New York and said, and said you're ready man want to do it in two weeks it was August Jeez. so I didn't have like two so you know how it is you cobble this 
a lot of people don't understand, it's a very unnatural set back then. I don't know how to do it now. Maybe they just pull five minutes out of the act intact on five. But you pull like a greatest hits thing. You pull right. a, a joke from this bit. You pull That's a joke how I from always that did bit. it, yeah. yeah. And you cobble together with these weird segues, right? You know, you do a skiing, water skiing joke. Then you go, you know, when you come out of water, your hair's messed up. You know when I get my hair cut? And then yeah. you're like, <laughs> like it's <laughs> torturous, man. Speaking of hair. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah. horrible. Yeah. And uh, so I, I put this set together, you know, that he helped me with. And then I'm practicing it every night, you know, just going into clubs every night as many times as I could, running out to a Jersey gig, coming back, doing a bunch Muttering of Muttering it while you're brushing your teeth. <laughs> the whole fucking thing, completely <laughs> freaking out. Yeah. And I, I, I was drinking and doing a lot of blow back then. So I was like, I got to quit. Like I, I got to quit. So a week before, I thought, I just, I, I'm not going to drink and do drugs. Were you high when they told you you got the gig? Oh, yeah. We went out to a bar afterwards. McCulley and I went out to a bar when he said, you got it. Let's go talk about it. We went out to a bar drinking. I didn't do blow in front of him because I didn't right. know whether he did it or not. I wasn't going to risk that, you know, but we mm-hmm. were drinking. Yeah. Hell yeah. And uh, I got so stressed out. I got shingles. I broke out in shingles. Oh, my God. You know, my, my, my ass and my leg were just blistered up. And I didn't know what there was. I went to the doctor. He said, you got shingles, man. I said, what? Yeah, you got shingles. That's an old man's thing. What are you, what are you stressed out about something? Yeah. Yeah. Said, yeah, I'm doing the Tonight Show. Yeah, yeah. Then he's probably like, when, when is it? He's like, no, yeah, yeah, add to the stress, because now I know you're watching, and you're going to be at home going like, hey, this fucking guy got shingles. <laughs> he's, got, he's got blisters on his ass. Wow. Yeah. And So, so you're you, standing backstage, right? Yeah. So the, 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 this is Burbank, obviously, 84. Right, they're right. shooting at Burbank. So yeah. that's, there's the, the fucking curtain was iconic. Every, that fucking gold and blue and weird ass, all those weird colors. All I could think about was fucking up. I mean, literally, I'm like going, I can't fuck up. You don't think about how much fun you're going to have? Yeah. I didn't think, like, oh, this is going to be fun, man. I I, I earned this. Yeah. I I deserve this. I'm going to go out and go and have a good time and say, what's up, Johnny? You're not just like, yeah. Yeah. Did you have the panic thought of what what if I forget where I am? What if I forget what I'm saying? Because didn't that that happen to somebody? It happened to me on my HBO special. I blanked on my HBO special. Oh, God. For how long? I would have to stop taping. I just went, I, I, I'm lost. I'm lost. Because it was, again, it was now instead of a five minutes unnatural, I'd like cobble together a half hour out of like hours of material mm-hmm. and posted that, you know, like just all together, just, kind of just right. cut and paste, cut and paste. And I was practicing that for a long time. And I got out there and I just went, what, what am I doing? What, what the, you know, it's like one of those things where you're going, what the fuck am I doing? It's almost like Biff from Death of a Salesman. Why, why am I well, making this contemptuous is- bid here? What happens is you go out there and rather than just doing a show, you know you're being watched and then you start watching yourself and then you leave yourself. It, it, and then you're sitting yeah. in the crowd going, why is he yeah. moving his arm like that? Because you're literally <laughs> thinking, oh, wow, dude. We've all fucking been yeah, there. Yeah. So when you're standing behind that curtain and you just... Yeah. And just it, adrenaline was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Then you yeah. walk out and then you hit it. And as soon as, but it's like every other time. I mean, my, literally my mind went blank. Like every time before I go on stage, my mind goes blank. I can't, if you go, what joke are you going to do? What joke? I don't have any jokes. I can't remember yeah. anything. Yeah. Totally blank, right? And walk out there, do that first joke, get the first laugh and go. Yeah. You're locked is, in. Yeah. That first laugh and you're locked in. So you went out, like, you did your first joke. Yeah. How did it do? Good laugh. Got a good and, laugh. And, 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 you know, when you're doing it, you're playing it, everybody says the first joke is just them seeing you and hearing you for the first time, so don't expect a big laugh, so you don't put your, you know, you know you, the, the, I, I always was told, and the, the, three jokes in, that's your first killer joke. Right. You know, three jokes in, that should be your first killer joke. That's how you kind of planned it. I know, they, all right. these fucking guys right. with their ideas. Yeah, And then yeah. the fifth joke should be this, and then you're just, oh, great, more shit to think about. <laughs> it is so, unnatural. It's unnatural. Yeah, no, so... It was unnatural. So you go out there, and you end up, you end up having... How this, how really good set. Have a really good really set. Really good set. You'll, now you're like, how long did it feel to look over at Johnny? Like, fuck. Oh, I'm, no. I'm going to lock eyes with this guy. Got that. Looked over. Big smile. You know, big oh. smile with a circle finger, like you said, like, big okay. And I go, okay. And I came backstage, and... Jim McCauley greets me, I got a beer, hands me a beer. Oh, great, fantastic, man. Stand over here. Stand over here. At the end of the show, you stand here. And when Carson walks back the way he walks back every after every show, this route he takes backstage, you're mm-hmm. right there on the route. He stops, shakes your hand. That was great. Get a photo op. Fantastic. Oh, you you're going to come back soon. You. You're going to come back soon. Yeah, I got a picture. You know, you got a picture. Wow. And you're going to stand there going, okay. And then he, he was fantastic. He moves on, right? And you're like, this is it. Then you go back and the improv that night in on Melrose in West, uh, you know, West Hollywood. Right. Everybody was there. They turned the TV up. 
Everybody in the bar is standing there. You're standing there. That's what kills me about how they redid that. Now they got the bar upstairs. It's like all, all that history. You guys, all those people that stood there watching their friends tonight yeah. show set, yeah. everybody who leaned on that yeah. fucking bar kills me. At least they didn't and, demolish it. And John, John used to say the same thing when a new comic. I'm glad you're in a good mood tonight because we've got a new comic coming on. right? And the comics would mouth it. And, and some would actually say it out loud with Johnny. That's how much everybody knew that. Wow. That, that, that routine. Right. Right, and you stand there, and it's like, yeah, and everybody's so cheering you. How much blow did you do that night when you got <laughs> fucking past that? Jesus Christ! I had coke in my pocket when I walked out on the set that day. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much I knew I was. Dude, I was you guys going to totally like when you watch Ron, like the fucking uh, Ron Burgundy, and all those fucking movies. Did that look more like a documentary to you than <laughs> rather than a comedy? It's like, yeah, we did all that. I had a suit like that. I wore that on the Tonight Show. I had blow in my pocket. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. man, that's fucking amazing. Well. We we gotta uh, I gotta run back to this. I'm in the middle of editing this fucking cartoon that's never gonna end, dude. I, I gotta tell you, man. Like this, you've been one. I've, I've had great guests, but this was just so fucking. I would. Do I, hope, I hope people you, listening I had as it. much fun as I did. Like I could ask you a zillion. <laughs> how do you not talk to a guy who fucking had coke in his pocket when he does the fucking Tonight Show? <laughs> You're like, I'm doing this either way. This is either going to make me super happy or make me want to fucking kill myself. So his book is called Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Boom. Um, where can people get this? Uh, Amazon. Amazon.com. Amazon.com. Yeah, I'm going to do Book Soup, uh, uh, a signing, a book signing at Book Soup over oh, in West great. Hollywood on when January 6th. January 6th. 7 o'clock, January 6th. I'm going to do a signing. I'll tell some stories. Will you have any Coke in your pocket? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have a snow out. seal filled with sugar. <laughs> Listen, Rich, it's been such a pleasure, man. Thank man. you so much for hey, coming I on. I'm going to say this. My son is angry he can't beat it again. He's a huge fan. Oh, Jesus. He's a huge That's fan. That's awesome. And man. he is uh, 17 years old. He is a banger, man. And he so digs you. And he was like, oh, Dad, man, can I get out of school? Can I just? Nah. Can't do it. All right, when he's of age, he can yeah. come out to the clubs. Yeah, just reach out, it, and uh, yeah. hopefully I'm still funny at that point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Rich Scheidner, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on, man. All right, man. All right.